Welcome everyone this fine fall slash winter evening. Um, this is a here for you session specifically for Waterways residents and we have a number of topics to cover which I'm sure you're all interested in. A uh, couple of ground rules and reminders before I go into the agenda. Um, this is uh, a shared session and we want to give everyone the opportunity to participate. So uh, we will be taking Q and A's after the full presentations and we have a microphone set up here for that. Um, this is live streamed and I do need to remind everyone to remain polite and respectful of the presenters who are doing their best the best they can to provide information to you. And also to remember that you have neighbors here and we have children in the audience. So uh, let's just keep the um, the respect and the, and the politeness um, going. And um, the agenda we're going to cover this evening includes um, overview of the survey results uh, that we got from Waterways residents that helped us understand what your desires are in terms of moving back into the area and how we're going to accommodate that. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about the flood hazard area and what that entails. I'm sure to most of you that won't be new. Uh, some planning and development considerations, uh, or a bit of a review of the permitting process for those of you who are anxious to get into that. Um, our legal counsel is going to talk a little, a little bit about the legal waiver that will be required for flood hazard development, some geotechnical explanations, and then a little more detail and instructions on what you can do if you're interested in moving out of the flood hazard area. We had some really great questions and equally wonderful answers um, in our earlier session. And for those of you who would like to read them, they'll be posted on our um, rmwb.ca slash engage website uh, probably sometime tomorrow. So I do encourage you to follow up and read those questions and answers. So without further ado, I'll introduce Dana Woodwork. He is our recovery task force lead and he's going to start out with the agenda. Thanks, Brenda. Uh, my name is Dana Woodworth, the Recovery Task Force Leader for uh, the Regional Spending of Buffalo. Thank you for coming tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to actually feedback what we heard from the survey results and uh, as well to become better informed at the end of this session in the questions and answers, but to be better informed on potentially other choices that could be made to, to support your needs. The resident feedback that we received was based on a survey that was sent out and it was opened on September 8th and closed on the 30th. The results were collated and uh, passed back by a series of different communication methods on the, I think it was the 3rd of October. This slide is a synopsis of the, uh, the survey itself. It's not an exhaustive survey. It, it did not touch every single resident of waterways, we recognize that. And I would point out that, that has been noted in the previous session tonight and commented on as potentially something we want to consider. Is it strong enough in terms of policy decisions? And, we accept that, uh, that advice and we certainly have a hard look at it. Having said that, it was a significant number of responses at 146. And it does have some, uh, some bearing in our consideration and actually framing why we're here in front of you tonight and what we want to learn more about. This table is uh, it's indicative. It's a, it's a survey results and I'll just start top down on the options. So, you know, to, to send a survey, we have to start somewhere. Um, you have to frame the conversation, and we chose to frame it with three options for you to consider, knowing that that's not necessarily your reality or all that could be. But that's what we sent out and asked for advice on. And we deliberately also sought other, other choices that you would express to us and let us know what we might not be thinking of or clearly what, what you would want us to consider. So if you look at the results in front of you, uh, a very strong uh, return on this survey for the status quo. So a large majority of the people surveyed simply wanted to return to the community, which is understandable, and rebuild and, and make their, their community and their lives whole. There were obviously some other less significant returns on ideas around swapping land, but of significance and generated from you at the community level 
was the concept of potentially a buyout of the land, um, and specifically people who had expressed the desire to find a way to leave the flood hazard area. So we give you this as, as pure feedback at this point, let you know what we heard, and it's also shaping what we're doing here tonight. We will find an opportunity, we've set it up at the end of this session and the questions. We're gonna have an opportunity for those who want to tell us more about what possibly leaving the flood hazard area looks like. We have a separate room to have that conversation with so we can better understand it. I'm gonna turn the floor over the mic to Aaron O'Neill, give you some uh, refresher, in many cases what you already know on your own community. Thank you, Dana. As Dana said, my name is Erin O'Neill and I'm the Operations Manager for the Wildfire Recovery Task Force. So on the screen you will see um, the map of the flood hazard area. So the flood hazard area is made up of, of two items, the floodway. And the floodway is considered areas where when there is a flood, the velocities of the water in this area are faster than one meter per second. And then there is the flood fringe, which also makes up the flood hazard area, where the water is a little slower than less than one meter per second. So the, both of those areas constitute the flood hazard area, as determined by the government of Alberta. Now that area is indicated in the hatched area on that map. Um, the ma majority of the waterways in the neighborhood is located in that flood hazard area. Now we do have the map um, on the screen. We do also have the map over here if you want to check out your specific lot. Um, we are, as Dana mentioned, talking about um, the potential option of um, examining, looking at people moving out of that flood hazard area. So um, we do have the other room where we have those maps where you can see exactly where your lot is and what those considerations are. Um, at this time, I am going to pass it over to Dan Fitzgerald and Chris Booth with our Planning and Development Department, and they will go into uh, the planning and developmenting considerations and permitting requirements for you. Thank you, Aaron. My name is Dan Fitzgerald, and I am a planner with the Community Development Planning Branch here in Fort McMurray. I'm joined here with my colleague, Chris Booth. So what I'm going to do is provide a quick, uh, brief synopsis of the wildfire uh, recovery overlay. And I'm going to get into uh, the flood bylaw regulations uh, that were passed by council, or more, more appropriately, I guess, uh, repealed by council. And then Chris is going to go through the development procedures process uh, with you. So to start off, uh, bylaw 16020 is the wildfire recovery overlay bylaw. It was introduced as part 11 of the land use bylaw, and it applies to wildfire damaged areas, which also now include the entirety of waterways. This bylaw sought to repeal bylaw 0736, and it provides direction for rebuilding uh, two residential properties. It gives certainty to those homeowners that will rebuild the same footprint as existed previously. So where that comes into play is there was questions that uh, came up within the municipality as to whether or not individuals were going to be able to rebuild their property even though that they did not conform to the current bylaw standards. So this helps to you know, give residents the certainty as well as planning staff when they're making these decisions to say okay even though it doesn't extend uh, to the bylaw, it doesn't conform necessarily to the bylaw standards that are in today, but it did back in the day, we are going to respect this. We are going to allow you to rebuild that same footprint that was there before. It also expands the range of rebuilding options for owners that want to propose a different style of development on the property. It's important to note that in the wildcard recovery overlay, all the land uses in the overlay districts are considered discretionary. It also means that the development officers may impose site-specific conditions as it deems advisable to address technical planning and land use issues. It's also very important to note that the bylaw requires development officers uh, to issue development permits for single-family homes even if a dwelling or even if the lot is 7.6 meters or larger. So traditionally, a uh, 7.6 meter lot would, uh, in, in terms of the existing land use bylaw, uh, not be able to accommodate a single attached home. Not necessarily something that you're going to run into in the waterways neighborhood, but certainly in other neighborhoods of, of the municipality. Um, so what this does is it gives everyone the opportunity to redevelop regardless of the size of their lot. 
And now what I'm going to quickly touch on is bylaw 16021, which was the flood hazard zone bylaw. It was introduced uh, by council, and uh, basically the original uh, introduction was to repeal bylaw number 13032. So bylaw 13032 was a reaction to the floods in 2013, which uh, res put restrictions on development within the floodplain hazard areas. What it specifically stated is that no habitable space could be located below the 250 meter elevation. Uh, this is no longer the case. So with the repeal of bylaw number zero, or 13032, we also repealed existing sections that were in the uh, 99059 land use bylaw section 60. Uh, most specifically, I'll bring your attention to section 60.3, which uh, strictly prohibited any lots from developing that were uh, below the 248 meter contour level. Uh, this in the waterways area is, translates into approximately 47 lots. Um, so with the removal of that, this, this now provides residents within the waterways area, that last hurdle that they were facing, gives them that certainty that they can now move forward and actually redevelop their properties within, regardless of whether or not it's in the floodplain or regardless of what contour it is at now. Uh, something to note and something that our legal counsel will touch on and give the floor a little bit later is uh, that rebuilding in the, flood, uh, the floodway or flood fringe area does pose a risk and therefore the owners uh, will need to acknowledge that risk by signing a safe harmless agreement and register it on title. And David's also going to go through a couple um, additional requirements that the municipality is, is suggesting uh, that be placed uh, on land titles for residents within that area. So I'm now going to hand it off to Chris who's going to uh, go through the development procedure regulations for you guys. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Booth. I'm also a member of the Community Development Planning Branch. Uh, what I'd like to run through very quickly with you is the process that you'll have to follow when obtaining your development permit, and actually the, the, entire, the entire collection of permits that you'll have to get. But what I'm going to be focusing on is the development permit. I'd like to stress that the, uh, the development permit is the very first start of your rebuilding process. After you obtain that permit, you will be required to obtain a building permit, followed by any other necessary trades permits for electrical, plumbing, gas, that kind of thing. Um, but it all will start with the development permit. And we are here for you, I'd, I'd like to stress this, we are here to, to help you through this process. It can be very daunting when you have to undertake this. So what we are here for you is to help get you through that application checklist, get you through submitting those documents in a way that makes sense. So what I'm going to touch on here very quickly is um, our land use bylaw. And what I have for you um, on the screen in just a second will be an example of one of our land use districts. And uh, this just shows you generally what you can expect. This talks about heights, setbacks, those could be rear yard setbacks, front yard setbacks. Those are all the things that we will take a look at when we're assessing a development permit. Parking requirements is, uh, is another interesting one. Uh, lot coverage. These are these are items that can sometimes not make sense when you're when you're just thinking about a new rebuild. You know, we, we can help you make some of those preliminary calculations in person at the office. If you bring in examples of, of what you want to do, we can sit down with you and see will this fit, will this work. We are here to be able to provide that service to you. And one of the next slides that I'll show you is an example of some of the variety of zones or land use districts that you will find in waterways. Um, any of you who are homeowners in the area, you will have a property that is designated one of these acronyms. Uh, a lot of the area is designated as R1M, and that's just a fancy word for, or fancy acronym for saying this is a mixed use, mixed typology district. This is where you'll be able to find mobile homes existing alongside single detached residential buildings or houses. Uh, this is one of the only areas in, the, in, in Fort McMurray that, that offers this typology, so it's very unique to waterways. So again, come in, talk to us about these districts. A lot of them can be, um, can be challenging, some of them can be unique, so we urge you again to you know, even, even speak to us after this session. We have copies of each of these zones available for you to take away tonight. 
So after you have an idea of what you want to do and you've been able to speak to us a little bit about it, you're going to be faced with actually making the application. And this is where the development permit application checklist comes into play. This can be, at times, a very long document, um, and it has a lot of text on it, lots of different bullet points that you will have to check off as, as providing. This is another daunting aspect of, of, the, of the application process that we can help you through. Um, uh, some, some of it is just a, a site plan. And what that is very simply is just an overhead bird's eye view of your property. This is where your house is going to be located. This is where your garage is going to be located. Sheds, any kind of structure. Um, building plans. This is going to show us the layout of the inside of your home. Floor plans. Um, abandoned well site information is an interesting one. This is not something that is very difficult to obtain. In fact, it's free to obtain from the province of Alberta. Uh, it's, it's on their website. It's a mapping tool. You plug in your address and you're able to find out whether there's an abandoned well site on or near your property. Again, we can help you find that information. So we will be here tonight to be able to walk you through any ideas that you may have, any obstacles that you are currently facing in an application process. You will be able to reach any of us by phone or by email. You can even come into our offices if you haven't already, 309 Powder Drive, and any one of us, uh, myself, Dan, Azela, Amina, there's a number of planners there who work there who are very capable of walking you through this process. So if you have any questions here tonight, we will be available following the presentation. Thank you. We'll turn it over at this point to David. Good evening, everyone. My name is David Flar. I'm the um, Director of Legal and Legislative Services for, for the municipality, which means I'm the one that gives them their legal advice. So I'm here just to speak to one fairly narrow area, but uh, it's more to, um, I guess, to explain to you why we're going to do one particular thing and to alert you that it's coming so you won't be surprised. So any of you that have ever applied for a development permit for anything, any time in your life, or anywhere, will be aware that you get your permit and usually, well always, your permit will have certain conditions attached to it. In other words, yes, you get to do this thing, you get to do this development, provided that you do A, B, C, whatever. Typically, for a residential development, these conditions are straightforward, simple, and there's very few of them. Uh, what we're going to be doing here, though, in, in, with respect to the areas of waterways that are within the flood hazard zone, I, I emphasize what I'm about to say applies only if you're in the flood hazard zone. If you're in waterways but on one of those higher elevated lots that's out of the flood hazard zone, then what I'm about to say is probably irrelevant to you. But if you're in the flood hazard zone, one of the conditions of development permit is that you're going to be asked to enter into at least one, probably a couple of different legal agreements. Uh, we call them things like development agreements or restrictive covenants, uh, waivers, that, that have this in common. They are intended to ensure that you acknowledge in writing that although you're being allowed to, to rebuild, those restrictions have been taken away, right? But you have to acknowledge that you're in a flood hazard zone and that there is a risk involved with that, okay? And you will basically agree that, you know, if in fact a flood does occur, you'll, you won't come after the municipality and say, well, you're responsible because after all, you're being, you've asked, well, by applying for a development permit, you're essentially asking for permission to take that risk to build in a flood hazard zone. And we're saying, yes, fine. We're okay with that. Just don't blame us later. Simple as that. And there's another reason for this, though, because you may not be the owner forever. In fact, undoubtedly you won't. Almost every property at some point changes hands through sale or inheritance or whatever. We want to be sure that any potential future purchaser or anyone who acquires that land in any way is suitably warned that it is in a flood hazard zone. You may say, well, why, why do we care about that? Well, the Supreme Court of Canada in a very famous case called Kamloops versus Nielsen made it clear that if you are a municipality and if you are aware of a particular risk that's involved with a particular property, you have a duty to warn potential future owners of that property. 
And there's really no practical way to warn a potential future purchaser unless you have an agreement that's been entered into at the time of the development that's put on the title. Okay? So the intention of us asking you to enter into these simple, basically, agreements is so that they can be registered on the title to your property, so that basically they, they serve to ensure that any future potential purchaser is at least aware that this is in a flood hazard zone. Now, the couple of questions in the earlier session arose, so I'm going to try to deal with them now in case you have these questions. Don't, that doesn't mean you can't answer them. You know, ask any question you want. But, but uh, some people wonder, well, what if I'm on a lot that's partly in the flood hazard zone and partly not? If you look at that map, you'll see that there are a number of properties that where the flood hazard line kind of runs kind of right through the property. Those we will deal with on a one-off basis. There may be ways that you can construct, ways you can kind of change the grading and the elevation such that we're satisfied that there is not that risk anymore, that we would not then require you to sign any such legal document. Uh, another question, well, you know, uh, does this mean that I will never be able to get insurance if this caveat to, is on my title? Uh, rest assured, the question of whether you can even obtain insurance, and if so, at what cost, has nothing to do with what's on your title. It has everything to do with the actual risk. So if it's hard to get overland flood insurance, if you're in a flood hazard zone, that's because the insurance company, the insurance industry as a whole, has looked at that and said, wow, this is too much of a risk for us to insure. It has nothing to do with the caveat being on your property. Other people worry, well, does this destroy the saleability of my property? Well, to be honest, if there's a caveat on your title, and if, if, you, if you had a, someone who maybe was interested in your property who was blissfully unaware that this is in a flood hazard zone, it is, I suppose, remotely possible that this caveat alone might scare that person away. But, a couple of things about that. First of all, the, the chances of someone being interested in buying in waterways and not being aware through other means that this is a flood hazard zone are pretty small. Most people are going to generally be aware that, boy, that's pretty low lying, that's close to a river, is that not a risk for flood? People generally are going to be aware of that anyway. And the, also, the important thing to remember is that we have committed that when, after these, these instruments, these caveats and agreements go on your title, we are going to watch and see what happens with actual physical flood mitigation that you've heard about earlier, the, uh, you know, the potential to build, whether it's a demountable flood wall or a berm, whatever it turns out to be. Once the 1 in 100 year level of flood protection is in place, we will revisit these caveats on your title. We'll reconsider whether they're needed or not. And one other question that came to me that was a fascinating one is, okay, so what if I'm in the flood hazard zone, but if I voluntarily build my property up above the 1 in 100 year flood level, I'm going to be very honest with you. I haven't even thought about that. But it's a question that, that's a good question, and our whole team is going to consider that carefully and determine if you did that, whether you would, we would even need you to enter into these sorts of legal agreements and put them on your title. So that covers as much as I, I think I can, you know, unless there's questions that I haven't thought of. But I believe, Dana, you're going to wrap it up here. And, Thanks, David. So just a couple slides and I'll uh, return the floor to Brenda and we have some questions. I want to talk about geotechnical considerations and uh, land use bylaw. So section 62 of that bylaw. So with respect to developments, setbacks from slopes does require that a geotechnical report is submitted at the time of the development permit application. Of note, the second bullet on the slide in front of you, on September 27th of this year, Council approved the following motion that Council direct administration to complete the overall geotechnical assessment for the water use area. I just want to highlight uh, a couple aspects of that sentence. Overall geotechnical assessment in, in waterways area. Uh, the intent is for the administration, and by default you as well, to be better informed on this particular area of your community from a geotechnical perspective. So it's not a lot by lot assessment. It does not necessarily negate the requirement for a, a property owner to do that, but it may. 
it will really depend on the type of information that's returned from this area wide assessment. So it's a good thing in terms of information is always good for planning purposes. You can guess what the soil conditions are and what the stability is, or you can actually do a geotechnical assessment. So that's what we'll do. The uh, RFP has been posted and closed, and we're going to reduce emissions and award the work. It will provide a, a higher degree of understanding and uh, certainty, not only for the land use planners, but for you as residents in this particular area. So I just want to highlight that for you. So we're back to the start. We, uh, we surveyed, we assessed the results of the survey, and in particular when we're finished uh, the questions tonight, we actually want to talk to people who have indicated to us that they may be interested in moving out of the flood hazard area. So we'll do that several doors down. So it's based on what you've told us to date. Uh, understand that this slide does not indicate a decision has been taken. We want to better understand what you've told us through a survey, and really the best way is to make individual contact with the residents, understand where your property is, and start to gather information which will be pertinent to kind of policy development. And one of the more pertinent pieces of information would be the cost that might be associated with land if you were going to look at a policy that would allow someone to leave a flood hazard area and cost for the municipality. So that will occur tonight. It's uh, an understanding for us that we need to know more and hopefully you'll share more. You'll have the opportunity in a face-to-face -face study to help us better understand the survey results that you found back to us. I'll turn the floor over. Thanks, Dana. So, lots of information tonight. Some of it's new, some of it you've heard before. Um, now's the time for you to ask your questions. I'm going to ask you that you come to the mic over here because, as you know, we are um, live streaming this, and that's the only way that the people who are watching and listening online can hear your question. Um, we're also taking questions online, so if I don't have anybody who's brave enough to come up to that mic, I'll start with one of those. Um, and the other reminder is that we've got lots of people here, hopefully with lots of questions. So if you're lined up with a mic and you see three or four people behind you, and you still have four or five more questions to go, maybe you could let the next person go and, and wait and ask your question afterwards. And also a reminder that, as always, we have lots of great experts in the room. Most of us are wearing the RMWB lanyards, so we're identifiable, and we'll be on the other side of the curtains when this is over, and more than happy to engage with you one-on-one -on -one to answer your specific questions about your specific situation. Uh, so I don't see... Oh, Jim? Get up there. They, there seems to be uh, a sort of some kind of a disconnect between the municipality and the, the people in waterways. And I'm wanting to come to a better understanding of that. Uh, in that now, um, for example, there never was any flowing water through waterways through either of the floods. And at the time of the flood, the railway track right away that was the sort of the flood dike, frozen during the, the spring flood area time, uh, sort of the water kind of knocked out the rocks underneath the, uh, the track and it dug out a sort of a, 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 a swale underneath where the water entered into waterways. The, uh, the, the railway track right away that went around by the swimming hole uh, was pretty much at the same level as that. And by the time the tracks were removed and that road bed was sort of set up for the, the highway to be built, uh, it was like a, a meter and a half high slope to get from the loop part of the road bed up to. So I'm assuming that when that happened, or like when the road was being built, it started off with the road bed that they started to build on was already higher than the previous floods had been. So uh, any, any flood risk in my mind has to do with uh, the gates on the drainage or the fact that the, the municipality has um, in the last two years when they did the redevelopment at the, at the Park Street area uh, actively dug out Park Street um, in excess of a, a meter in depth. Uh, so, and, and 
I don't like to think that it was actually deliberately done so that waterways could then, in fact, qualify as a flood zone even with the road right away. But when we're now talking about bringing material like clay from the hill and filling the that Park Street area that's low or filling in and making some kind of a, of a, a man-made um, structure there, uh, that, that we're going to have the cooperation of the municipality in that flood mitigation that is actually quite cheaply possible to the appraisal of, of the community. That the other thing that, uh, that I'm just wanting to ask about is say the uh, options to have uh, a, um, a futuristic look at what a northern community would look like in the next 40 or 60 years and and have that uh, extended over into the possibilities for our community uh, so that we're uh, rather than just going with an appraised value of the condemned property uh, to actually have an appraisal based on uh, of waterways being a viable community into the future. Okay, Thank Jim, thanks. Now if I can paraphrase two questions. One is around flood mitigation, what's been done in the past and what will be done in the future. Um, and that one, I mean, if, if someone wants to speak to it here, um, more than welcome, but we will be having a follow-up session more detailed on flood mitigation strategies. Uh, and your second question is around waterways redevelopment, I take it. And, and, and possible uh, uh, zoning and maybe uh, based on, the, the, like we did have an area structure plan right. upgrade right. and all that. Okay, are you okay if I take the second question first? Thank you. All right. So, second question. Thank you, Jim. Um, with regards to the second question about um, sort of future development in waterways, um, the, the current plan in place, there is the city center area redevelopment plan. Uh, what that does is that sets out uh, sort of the future direction for the community that you've described sort of that, that future that future state. Um, what has not taken place, however, is the implementation of any zoning or land use districts to implement that plan. We're, we're still left with um, uh, the land use districts that have always been in place uh, since 1999. Uh, so uh, what, what we're hoping to do in the near future is move forward with um, the land use bylaw rewrite, which has been uh, an activity that's been uh, underway for a few years now. And uh, that will, at some point in the near future, be able to address uh, future rezoning. So if you are interested in that, by all means, become a part of that process as it moves forward. But at this point, we are not ready to begin um, conversations about what, what that might look like. We are focusing our efforts on the rebuild at this point. And, uh, but, but certainly, that doesn't preclude those conversations from happening in the future. But we are just, we are just placing our emphasis on um, on, on recovering from the fire at this point, but certainly we appreciate that the future will and, and must come. I'd like to say that that sounds perfectly rational, but it does not. Uh, if, if we're going to do rebuild, let's put the zoning in place and then see what the options are for the rebuild, rather than to jump ahead and say, well, do you want to rebuild it? And after the rebuild, We'll talk about changes to zoning. It just doesn't seem rational. We have now this whole process that we worked for about two years on this uh, area redevelopment plan. Let's at least open that up as an option for rebuild uh, uh, vision uh, prior to people uh, going out and putting what however they indebt themselves or however they manage to rebuild and then say, oh, now we're changing the zoning. Uh, please, uh, that would just be my, doesn't that seem a little more uh, strategically appropriate? I can certainly appreciate where you're coming from on that one, Jim, and I know a few other community members have expressed uh, 
that, that same preference. Uh, what we can do will certainly is bring that back to our management team. Uh, they are aware of that desire as well. Uh, but we've heard it out loud and clear here tonight from, uh, from that management team that we're not in a position to begin those, uh, those conversations yet, but certainly they have heard that, that desire loud and clear from you. Appreciate that. There was one other thing, and that is that you made some mention of the 1999 uh, uh, process. As far as I know, uh, there was no uh, change in zoning that was connected to that, other than that there was something to do with uh, recreational vehicles being parked in front of people's houses. It was the big event. And uh, uh, in fact, the uh, plan that uh, is still in effect in waterways is basically the plan from 1983 uh, that was the uh, NIP program uh, 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 vision uh, of uh, waterways as a, a, a future community. Uh, honestly, I, I, we have copies of that. Certainly, I, I'd be more than willing, uh, Dan, Dan and myself would be more than willing to speak to you about that. Uh, uh, following the session in a little bit more detail. I, I certainly appreciate that, Jim. If, if you're interested, we, we could speak about that after. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jim, and you're gonna give me a five out of 10 because I'm going to beg for your patience on your first question around flood mitigation. We have um, some additional work to do in our engineering department on that subject, and we will be hosting public engagement sessions, and we'd be more than happy to entertain some of your questions at that time. All right, thanks. Um, before the next one, I am just going to read one of the online questions. It's not specific to waterways, but um, it's, it's still a good question and it is being um, managed as a political issue. So I'm going to ask Councillor Vinnie to come up and answer it. The question is, how do you plan to combat the new 237% drywall tax to keep costs down for rebuilding. Councillor Vinny? Thanks, Brenda. Uh, yes, and it's, a, it's a fair question. Um, we, uh, as a council, talked about this at the public meeting last Tuesday, and we've been talking about this uh, nasty little uh, stab in the back that's uh, just adding to our woes since the, the day we heard about it. Um, I guess uh, generally what I've heard from my fellow councillors is we're going to try and uh, leverage our relationships and our, our friendships with uh, various uh, people that uh, live and work in Ottawa, people like uh, Kyle Ariatha and, uh, and of course our, our member of parliament. Um, for me specifically, um, I actually am honored to have the support of council for the last five years to be uh, uh, on the, uh, the with, with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. So I get to go to the quarterly board meetings um, of, of that organization, about 100 electric, elected uh, officials from municipalities across the country, across the country that meet every quarter. Uh, to talk about our representation of over 2,000 municipalities in this country. And as it, as it stands, every November we, we meet in Ottawa and we have a chance to, uh, to meet one-on-one -on -one with the, uh, the leaders of the political parties and we, we meet with, uh, in the offices of every senator and uh, member of parliament. Not all of us, but we kind of divide and go out there. So, uh, I believe a couple of councillors have indicated a desire to join me next month in going to Ottawa. And uh, as part of the, our uh, talks to the, all these uh, uh, elected uh, parliamentarians, we're going to uh, make the case that we need a, uh, we need a rebate program for Fort McMurray. You know, we don't have all the details of what that would look like, but essentially it would be, you know, you guys or your contractor keeping the uh, the receipts for your for your drywall costs and and then uh, you know us or through some organization presenting those to the federal government for 
for a rebate. I, I think it's too big of a job for us to, to get them to totally withdraw that tariff uh, that goes beyond our borders, but uh, there should be a, a rebate program for us, and that's the main point we're going to be making uh, when we talk to Mr. Trudeau and all the other people that, that make their living on the hill there in, in Ottawa. Uh, so uh, that's right now what I know about what we're going to do. It is a political thing, and we're, we're going to work it as hard as we can. Thank you. All right, we've got another question at the mic, and if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself as well, thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Merlin Landry. Uh, um, from waterways, or was from waterways. Uh, I just want to know what the city is going to do for the firefighting capabilities. Obviously, they don't have the right supply of water. They, uh, there's a certain criteria you have to follow by firefighters' codes. Uh, my home was in waterways, and uh, I got pictures of uh, three fire trucks sitting next to my home for half an hour. Yeah, even got a video of them leaving and not even coming out of their trucks because I guess they were saving water for somebody else. So, obviously we got a water problem. Why are we building right now when we have a water problem and we can't even fight the fires that will come in the future? Good question. And um, I'm not sure if we have the expertise in the room tonight to answer that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry about that. We should have come better prepared, but we'll definitely um, take up your question and get back to you. If you can give Sarah your phone number, email, yeah. whatever, okay? And I'd, I'd like to get a, an answer for why they sat there for half an hour and didn't do a thing. Our homes were there, they could have uh, watered them and we could have saved our homes. Instead, they let them burn. And I'm a one or the other short, so I've lost everything. Please do make sure that Sarah gets your name and your phone number and we'll get back to you on that. Thanks. Do we have any more questions from the one more? Yeah, Mr. Holland. Hello, good evening, Tom Holland. Um, I just want to throw it out there, kind of in relation back to Jimmy's question about what the uh, area is going to be looking like in the next few years, but with a couple of doors down where the city's talking about purchasing some lots, I'm kind of wondering what should they actually uh, go in that direction? What's the plan the municipality has to do with those lots of land? As I place my house there and then, yeah, so I got an empty lot that's owned by the municipality. What do you plan on doing with that lot next to me? I'm seeing a lot of heads shaking, Aaron, you're going to answer that one. Thank you for the question. So what we would what we would do as part of our, our overall um, plan tonight, we are opening that conversation on um, potentially moving individuals out of that flood hazard area. Um, that consideration, the cost consideration, would all be part of that overall plan of what we would do um, next steps if we can go down that um, route and what that would look like, um, whether they may, they're maintained as green space, um, or what that would look like for residents that would live by those areas um, that potentially could be owned by the city. So you really don't know what the area would look like then? Um, what we're doing is examining, we heard from the survey results that individuals are interested in uh, potential buyout, so we are investigating that because that is what we heard from the residents. Um, we do want to give it additional consideration, so we will be going forward um, with appraisals on those lots to see what those options are, and then looking at it as a, um, a whole package to see if that is possible and what that would do um, for the community in the long run. And what are you going to do with the land when you're done with it? You bought a, like, you bought a piece of land, what are you doing with it next? So typically when we, when we purchase land, our, our standard municipal acquisition process is we will not purchase land unless there's a need for that municipal land. Um, in this case, we are, we are responding to what residents heard. We haven't went down the um, what we will do, what will it look like, what will it be redeveloped, will it be green space. We haven't went down that path. That will all can be part of the planning considerations as we go down this, um, this path on, uh, on potential of moving people out of the flood hazard area. 
I'll answer that last one first. It is six meters from the property line. So the property line is sometimes close to the road, is sometimes back from us. You never quite know where it is. That's why we always ask for, for surveys so that we can see where the property line is. Um, and uh, sorry, I may have missed the beginning of, of, of that, sorry, the six meter. Um, that example that I showed up on the slide, that, that was a just a sample. Um, that number can change from district to district, from zone to zone. So um, uh, it wouldn't necessarily be six meters, that's just an example. Uh, as I said, we do have copies of the, of the districts, of the zones back there for people to walk away with tonight so that you have some certainty about what, what to expect. It's a very good question. And okay. part of that question is also, um, I'm just referencing uh, Lower Cliff Valley specifically, um, backing on Cliff Avenue. Um, so Lower Cliff Valley is the only access for those people on that street, right? Because of the incline of the lot. Um, so the issue that I'm having is that I am part of the road, so I'm not making use of my property like I could be. Is there any plan in place to put a proper road proper municipal infrastructure. <laughs> I, I, I pay taxes just like everyone else does here, and I'm probably the only street in Fort McMurray that doesn't have paved access to my property. I do apologize. I don't have the, the answer to that question. I'm not sure if anyone else does. Uh, sorry. Maybe that could be an example of one of these case-by-case -case situations that we'll have to discuss um, individually with you. Uh, I think it would be an excellent candidate for, for that discussion. Thanks very much. I think that's pretty. Nope. Just, uh, One I'd, more? Yes, I'd, I'd like to give recognition. Uh, maybe the lady doesn't know, but uh, uh, the whole Lower Cliff Avenue thing was an act of generosity and facilitation that was carried on quite imaginatively by the uh, planning department and the, the municipality. Uh, the, the, where I think we're really headed to as now, I was involved, at, I was in the council meeting when this uh, land use bylaw was passed, and there was nobody there, and there was no real public process, so people didn't have any good idea that this was going to become the vision uh, that would be uniformly uh, and, and, and roughly applied to our entire community in years and years to come. And where they got it from, maybe Florida, I don't know. But uh, uh, for a start, uh, because we have a cold side and a warm side to buildings, uh, uh, there's an absolutely nothing uh, achieved by having a six foot uh, uh, garden space on the north side of a building uh, for any reason at all. Uh, and then have your sunny backyard uh, 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 suffering some other uh, uh, series of regulations when in fact the sunshine is everything in this community and probably nothing in Arizona where this uh, land use bylaw came from. The, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, that's just the, uh, the, the comment and, and if anybody wants to comment on holding uh, 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 sternly with that land use bylaw and say oh no this is a land use bylaw, you have to build nonsense yeah, because it's written into the land use bylaw and we can't vary from that. I'm hoping that just like Lower Cliff Avenue, the, the municipality will go, hey, we can make this work. I'm, I, I, I just leave it with that because I, there's, there's a, there's, it seems to be sometimes a break in that people see the municipality as kind of the enemy and they actually really do try to make things work and I'm hoping for that kind of thing in the future. The, the other thing that I'm, uh, I'm now presently involved in meeting with various of my neighbors uh, uh, adjacent and adjacent and adjacent with a view to putting together some kind of a plan to bring to the municipality and I haven't really talked with anybody about it but I'm, I'm wanting to just get some feedback because I'm, uh, uh, any, if, if there is somebody that could say, uh, yes, if you get together with your neighbors, we'll listen or we will help or we'll, thank so, you. So your question, Jim, is are there people who are willing to listen to uh, 
delegation or a group of waterways folks who have some different ideas for the community? Um, uh, uh, in the municipality yeah. uh, and the planning process or whatever, like, can we work together to make something uh, and, something and, better? Yeah, that's yeah. A, that if my neighbors all say, yeah, we're good to go, uh, that we can get together and talk as a group about zoning or something like that. Yeah, um, I shouldn't answer for the planning department, so I'll let them answer. A uh, simple and very quick answer to that, uh, Jim, would be yes. We are absolutely willing to, to have those conversations with you, and, and, and we can do that. Uh, we can start those conversations tonight. We can continue them uh, in, in, in the office, but absolutely, we that's what we're here for, is to have those conversations. Excuse me, to have those conversations. Very welcome. All right, and I believe we have another question for the mic. Uh, just introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Liz. I have a question related to the slope behind waterways. It used to be all trees, a watershed. Now it's not, but it's still a slope. What's going to happen in the spring with additional rain, when the snow melts? Are we going to have a flood, not from the river, but from down over the hill? And the second question about that is, are we going to have a landslide? Uh, so thanks for that question. That is actually one of the portions that formed our request for proposal. So we did state um, the wildfire has changed the situation, has taken away a number of the trees, has changed the slope in that area. So that was one of um, the portions of the scope of work to that, to examine that. So that will all be um, considered as part of that overall geotechnical plan um, to see what has what's in place and what has changed because of the wildfire. the information because that is important for deciding whether or not to live there. So we did just close the request for proposal. We are reviewing those contracts and will award that contract shortly. Um, it could take um, over six weeks to have that have that report done. So we are working closely with that contractor to make sure that that will be done as expeditiously as, as possible. All right, I do believe that's it for the questions at the mic and online for tonight. As always, we've got a great group of experts available to talk to you individually about your unique circumstances. Um, the people from Planning and Development will be on the other side. And as Dana mentioned a couple of times, anyone interested in discussing moving out of the flood hazard area can join the representatives in the room just down that way. If you can't find it, just ask Sarah or somebody with a lanyard which way you should go. Thank you very much for your attendance this evening. Um, there is lots more information to come, as you've heard, around geotechnical work and around flood mitigation. So uh, if we don't have your email address um, and you want, to, um, you want us to keep in touch with you, please provide that and make sure that you're aware of upcoming engagement sessions. Thanks again.